Right. My name is Eric Jonas. I'm currently a postdoc at UC Berkeley in EECS, working primarily with Ben Recht, um, partly as part of the new Berkeley Center for Computational Imaging, and partly as part of this new thing called the RISE Lab, which is the uh, evolutionary, um, if not spiritual, successor to what was previously known as the AMP Lab. Um, and today I'm going to be mostly talking about um, a little bit about my, my actual day job. Um, uh, but mostly about this, this platform that, that we've started taking advantage of offered by Amazon Web Services called Lambda and a, a software layer we wrote called Pyren um, that's primarily designed to make a lot of the data science type calculations that uh, we do easy. Um, and what do I mean when I talk about those types of calculations? And I want to say, you know, um, it really, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older than I think the average postdoc, um, and it does really, in many ways, feel like the wheel has, has come around again and, and even again. Um, and in particular, a lot of things that used to be very easy, or at least I remember them as being very easy, now I may have been 22 at the time, so who really knows, um, seems like they've gotten very hard. And so we're going to talk about how we can kind of perhaps uh, um, reverse that trend a little bit for, for the both the users and the classes of applications I care about. And, and what are some of those examples? Well, a lot of what we do, oh, and going back, um, this is, of course, all joint work with, with my colleagues, uh, Shivaram, Shifan, and then our advisors, Ben and Jan. Um, um, the, I am not a systems person. Um, by I, I'm much more in the, the applied math bucket. Um, so this has been a fun adventure, I think, for, for everyone involved. Um, but um, a lot of what we work on are problems that are of a computational imaging nature. So problems like adaptive optics, where you'd like to kind of in real time adjust parameters of your imaging system to it, see things better. Or super resolution microscopy, where you want to use kind of strong priors about your image to see things you couldn't see before. Or t problems of tomography, where um, you'd like to see inside some structure just from boundary value measurements. Or problems like phase contrast microscopy, where the actual image that you're trying to receive, or recover is not visible in your target wavelength. But if you can exploit properties of, of phase delay, then maybe you can see the, the target. And in all of these application areas, um, we have this amazing property where we often have very good forward models, right? Physics, especially at this scale, is kind of by and large worked out. And so what we end up with are very good forward models that we'd like to run many, many, many times. Um, and um, often these are forward models that are, are being run using existing legacy pieces of software. Um, and perhaps rewriting them all is, is not a good idea for, um, certainly not for a postdoc, maybe not for a graduate student. And so part of our challenge was, how do we convince some of these colleagues, though, that we're collaborating with in these computational imaging spaces to give up their loved tools, right? So a lot of these busy physicists and double E's are all real MATLAB aficionados, right? And as, as someone with kind of formal computer science training, the idea of writing MATLAB um, as part of my day job makes me want to vomit a little bit. Um, similarly, how can you convince, uh, how can I convince like some of my solar physics co colleagues to um, give up tools like IDL, right, which is, is kind of like MATLAB, but worse in every way. Um, and it's hard because there's a tremendous amount of legacy software that's been written and, um, in both of these pipelines. And, and, and so the question becomes kind of how do you convince people? What is the hook you can use to get them to transition over to something that looks more modern or is, is kind of uh, uh, more amenable to, say, contemporary machine learning techniques like Python? Um, and so that, this was kind of the other hook here was can we build a platform that offers kind of sufficient advantage that we can, we can use this as a hook here. But of course, I hate computers. Um, you're trying to upset creep maples is what you're trying to Exactly, do. exactly. Um, no, and, 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 and there's this real problem though and that like, you know, the reality is that, that, that we all reluctantly use these, these um, approximations to Turing machines on our desk um, because they can do lots of powerful things, but also, you know, as someone who um, actually spilled coffee on my laptop keyboard two nights ago and, and the shift key has not recovered since, um, the physical instantiation of the hardware is an incredible uh, uh, pain point. And then also simply configuring and working with them can be quite a challenge. And, and this, isn't, this isn't just something that those of us who aren't real systems people run into. I mean, um, we have this weekly computational imaging lunch 
Um, and one of our graduate students, one of my collaborators, Shivaram, um, was trying to explain to everyone <coughs> when they should be using cloud infrastructure. Because, you know, on one hand, as, as my PI Ben likes to say, cloud is just another word for someone else's computer. Um, and that's true, but there are a lot of potential advantages, including reproducibility and, and uh, scale and the inability or the, the, the fact that you don't personally have to be the person making large capital outlays that make a lot of these novel cloud computing environments attractive. But what, while we were giving this talk and Chevron was walking through kind of, you know, what the different storage mechanisms are and the difference between S3 and DynamoDB and all of these sorts of things, um, one of the PIs, uh, Ren Ng, um, who's now a professor at Berkeley, said, well, why is there no cloud button? And <clears throat> at the time, um, we all thought he was nuts and we're like, that's such a Ren thing to say. Like, of course, you want to think about like the simple product that we could try and sell. It's very uh, uh, product focused uh, uh, PI. Um, and what would a cloud button even be? But when we started talking about it um, and talking to more and more of our, our colleagues, we came to this realization that in fact, there is no cloud button, but maybe there could be. And, and in fact, it really does seem that the cloud is too damn hard. Um, for a large class of users. So, so James McMillan, the, the founder of the, the Rent is Too Damn High Party, may have really hit on something here, right? Um, and when we did a survey in the, AMP, in the then AMP lab, now RISE lab of graduate students, so these are graduate students for, with PIs like Jan Stoika, Mike Jordan, you know, these are, these are the people who should be using parallel distributed programming primitives that we're building in-house. And less than half of the graduate students in our group had ever written a Spark or Hadoop job. And this wasn't necessarily because they, you know, they had all taken the, I don't know what the Berkeley equivalent is of, of the theoretical distributed computing class that was taught by like Nancy Lynch at MIT when, when I was an undergrad. Like everyone understands these primitives, but it's just hard. There's a lot of friction. And even though we kept running into situations where we were like, God, I wish I could scale this operation out to 1,000 or 10,000 nodes uh, relatively quickly, um, no one was doing it. And part of that reason is that, you know, when you start trying to use infrastructure, like Amazon Web Services, right? So this is um, ec2instances.info, and it's the kind of easy uh, view of all of the different types of machines, so all the different configurations that Amazon will let you use. And you know, it's not really that easy of a list to parse, right? And of course, I know what all these things mean now, um, and many of our graduate students do, but it's very bewildering for someone just coming to this ecosystem. Right, and so we started joking about how the cloud is too damn hard, and you do have to start making a lot of these decisions even before you start using this infrastructure, right? Like what instance type are you going to use? What is your base image? Do you want Ubuntu? Do you want some CentOS derivative? And if you start saying these things to like one of your applied physics friends, they're gonna say like, why are you asking me these questions? I just, I just wanna run my code. And then on top of that, when you start thinking about kind of trying to scale up your job for many of these types of infrastructures, including Spark, um, you have to make a lot of commitments at the beginning. How many instances are you spinning up? How much do you want to be spending on them? Do you want to be using things like spot instances, which are ephemeral but potentially cheaper? And you have to make all these decisions one after another after another, and, that, and then you're left with a naked machine, which is kind of abysmal. Um, and you have to start doing things like configuring it with Spark or EC2 or using any of the kind of uh, um, well-curated yet still somewhat fragile pieces of infrastructure. And so what we really wanted was something that people could use for their embarrassingly parallel jobs, which had very little overhead for setup, right? The hope was that once someone had an Amazon Web Services account, and I'm gonna mostly be focusing on AWS, partly because um, uh, they're kind of pioneers in this space and partly because we have the most funding from them, um, so it's easy to accidentally spend a lot of money. Um, once someone has one of these accounts, um, it would be great if they could just start using it, right? We don't want there to be some sort of persistent overhead. We don't want someone to have to keep up a larger expensive cluster, nor necessarily wait for a 10 minute cluster, wait 10 to 20 to 50 minutes for one of these clusters to come up. And I know that that might not sound like a lot of time, but it really ends up being this insane piece of, of research friction to the point where even those of us who um, um, are comfortable with the tools are like, God, am I gonna spin up a cluster? I don't really wanna do it. Like it, it's, it's a lot of friction. So we want this low overhead for setup, right? And we'd like to have low kind of developer overhead for users as possible, right? Now, now, in some sense, if you're the sort of person who has been writing Python code for doing your data analysis, right? So you're not a systems person, but we're in these kind of vaulted data scientists that everyone keeps talking about. Um, it would be great if you could use a system like this through a reasonable interface, right? And ideally support as much of your legacy code as possible. For lots of people, you know, we've written our serial pipelines, we have some function, and we really just now want to run 10,000 copies of it with, say, different parameter settings, right? But we've got maybe, you know, 5,000, 10,000 lines that have written for this paper. I don't want to have to 
rejigger that into some fundamentally different computing paradigm to start using it. So we'd like to support as much of your kind of existing work as possible. We're targeting jobs that run in kind of the minutes or more regime. Right? I think that's also important, right? And any, any distributed systems, as, as I'm sure you all know, there are all these trade-offs and, and um, the kind of transaction overhead that you might pay for making something simple or easy to use um, would um, potentially hinder your ability to run a bunch of, say, tiny tasks, right? So, so we are, we're, in general, when people are using PyRan, I'm like, think about jobs and granularity of, of 30 seconds or more, right? Um, additionally here, I don't really want to run a service. Right? That is, I don't want to offer a front end for other people to use. I don't personally want to be the person maintaining some server or some batch queuing system or whatever. I would like to directly pay AWS. And that, that, that fits into, because you can imagine you could have certainly built something somewhat like this at any point over the past, say, 10 years, where you're taking in people's jobs, you're running them, and you're, you're spitting out the results. But I don't want to be doing that. I think most people don't want to be doing that either. This brings to our... our Next point that like whatever we're using has to be from a cloud player that's likely to give it an academic grant. You know, Amazon, Google, Azure. Um, there certainly are startups in this space, and there have been for the past few years that have been trying to tackle either this problem or similar problems. But generally, um, they're not excited to give 100K of credits to an academic project, right? Um, and there is also the question of how long are they going to be around. So the hope was that we could kind of um, take advantage of large established player technologies. So to go through this again, we want minimal overhead, right? We'd like to target kind of vanilla Python users for tar jobs that run in kind of the minutes to more regime. We really don't want to be the people running some particular service. So we don't want to do our own startup and we'd like to actually not depend on additional kind of players in the ecosystem outside those who we kind of trust and are, are going to give grants. So what are the type, who are the humans that we're writing this for? Um, because we are at least theoretically writing this for humans. Um, it's basically ourselves and our friends, right? Which is, is not surprising. So I want to parameter, uh, do hyperparameter sweeps over some um, filter parameters for looking at every image from the sun. Or one of my computational imaging colleagues, Nick Thantipa, um, he has a 10 minute algorithm he runs for image recovery and now he wants to do video. So he, he took, you know, a thousand frames and he'd like to be able to just do this without having to wait forever. Or Kevin Jamison in our group who works on active learning. Um, he has a NIPS paper that's due in six hours. This is with, you know, I think 27 days before the NIPS deadline. This is increasingly true. And you want error bars for that figure. And why is it that I'm going to have to wait, you know, um, um, n times the job for my, uh, my job running to do something that looks like a simple Monte Carlo search? So maybe the reality here is not that I hate computers, but I hate servers, right? I love the idea of computation. I hate the fact that there exists these physical entities that I have to manage. I have to make all these decisions about behind the scenes. I have to uh, uh, personally worry when they die. And so we started building this piece of, of software called PyRen, right? So, you know, you can have a, 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 that's the silhouette of a condor in the background. Some of us have actually played with, with condor as a, as a job scheduling system. And what we really wanted was the small version of that, right? So most wrens are small and rather inconspicuous birds. Um, except they have loud and, and complex songs. And so the hope was that we could kind of target these sorts of Condor-esque use cases, right? But in a way that preserved a lot of the elasticity that people have come to expect from the cloud. And two pieces of technology kind of fell in our lap, right? One is this Python distribution from a company called Continuum, um, um, called Anaconda. Um, and the other is a service from Amazon Web Services um, called Lambda, right? And so I'll start with Lambda. So Lambda is really neat because what Lambda basically does is lets you execute arbitrary functions on Amazon servers, on the cloud, where there are some interesting constraints here, right? Um, you get 300 seconds per job of a single core, right? AVX2 uh, um, uh, era core. You get 512 megs in temp. Um, you get one and a half gigs of RAM and they'll give you, let you run Python, Java, or Node code. And Amazon's goal for this has been very much one of building distributed systems for kind of companies building distributed systems using this kind of idea of microservices, where maybe you have one service that takes in images into, uh, sticks them in S3. You have another one that uh, maybe then you want to grab the images from S3, do some processing on them, and stick the results in a database. And you'd like to have that kind of dynamically scale with your customer load. And more and more people are trying to build these sorts of 
um, services um, using these sorts of fast running functions, right? And you know, their Amazon's model does very much seem to be people building these sorts of things that scale with kind of the number of users. And Amazon's not the only one providing these things. Um, Google has their cloud functions, which actually I think just entered beta, um, and Microsoft has their Azure functions, which which are similar. Um, so they provide this platform for us to kind of quickly and efficiently run these, these functions on the cloud. Um, so we'd like to provide an interface which looks like this, right? We'd like to just be able to have some arbitrary function, in this case, you know, add one, which is not doing anything terribly exciting, um, directly get a handle to an executor, and then just map our function over some list, right? The primary interface here that we're giving people is simple. Um, uh, um, is a sim simply a functional one, right? Because these functions themselves are stateless, right? This is the kind of the, the neat and weird point in this ecosystem. But of course, you can then, you get a list of futures back. It actually maps to the Python futures interface very closely, and the output is expected. This is not terribly exciting, right? Um, but the scale that you're potentially capable of achieving with this in interface is kind of, uh, we found it surprising, right? So if you look on the on your left there, right, we have we see that kind of the aggregate compute for doing DGEM on each of these, right? So doing dense matrix uh, matrix multiply here, unsurprisingly scales linearly with the number of of these these workers that are running, right? The number of of these things that you're kicking off behind the scenes. But the important point here is that you're not telling Amazon, I want. 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 workers. You're saying, hey, look, please give me as many as you possibly can. Here's my embarrassingly parallel set of jobs. Um, please run them. And you see that, you know, on average, this is with using uh, MKL as our, our backing numerics, we get kind of, for each of these cores, we get about 16 gigaflops of, of matrix vector multiply. The, the other neat things here include, you know, there's this little bump here at 32. Because, of course, when they tell you you get a core, you get a hyper-threaded core. So it's a fake core. So on some of the jobs, they actually get a full core to themselves, and, and they're running it twice as fast. Makes benchmarking a real fun exercise. The other surprising thing is that, of course, so you have these stateless functions, but you say, oh my gosh, Eric, I have lots of state, right? I'm taking in data. I want to save the output. How do I, how do I handle that? Well, we route all of this through S3, uh, Amazon's uh, object store. And okay, that's fine, but you know, isn't that slow? And it's certainly the case that you know, writing to S3, you can write it about 30 megabytes a second, and reading from S3 is on average about 40 megabytes per second. And that's what that, that histogram is up there. And there's some variance there. But the amazing thing is that the total aggregate throughput from these simultaneous workers that you can get to S3 approaches you know, 80 gigabytes per second for write or for read and 60 gigabytes per second for write. And that really surprised us, right? What that suggests is that you know, on the back end there, Amazon has kind of this incredibly scalable piece of infrastructure. Um, and that's starting to change the way we even on the system side think about building these sorts of uh, uh, distributed systems that do more than even simply offering this kind of map-like or, or map-reduced style interface. And I hope I can convince you that there's a lot you can do with map, um, including kind of a large number of ETL type compute tasks, right? So you want to extract some features from a bucket of images or whatever, as well as these sorts of parameter tuning cases. And whenever I talk to my, my uh, distributed systems or, or uh, friends or people who are building kind of large scale machine learning systems, they're like, well, those cases are all boring. And in some sense, they're right, right? Like pre-processing all of ImageNet, computing some deterministic features, and then throwing that into some large-scale learner is kind of boring. But it's so hard with the existing infrastructure if you don't already have something set up, right? And so for this example here where we say, hey, look, we have all uh, uh, ImageNet. We'd like to run some basically random Python code for featureization, including now we have people who are using you know, early stages of ConNets for this thing. Um, we'd like to kind of run this as quickly as possible. Um, how can we do that? And so Pyron makes that sort of task easy. And I can show you kind of the, the job lifetime here, where the, the x-axis here is the, the runtime in wall seconds, right? So we go from 0 to 250 seconds for, for processing all of ImageNet here, um, where the blue dots that you can kind of barely see on the left here are when the jobs are actually submitted from your workstation, right? Unsurprisingly, then, um, the jobs get started. These are these green dots here, right? So that's when Amazon actually pulls them out of its queue and begins running them, right? There's some jobs set up here, which, I'll, which is this gap here I'll talk about in a bit. The jobs run and we retrieve the results. Unsurprisingly, for example, there are stragglers because both there's variance in terms of trying to get data in and out of S3 
And sometimes for reasons we don't even quite understand uh, terribly well, um, there's contention on the individual nodes. I mean, these things are all heavily containerized and who really knows what's going on behind the nine layers of, of virtualization there. But we can look at the histogram of the amount of time that each of these phases is taking, right? And kind of unsurprisingly, that, or surprisingly to me actually, the starting latency for when your host throws something over to Lambda to when it starts ex executing it is shockingly low, right? Kind of on the order of, of the mean is certainly a second and the, the, the max there is roughly, let's say, three or four seconds. Um, but then um, there's this, the setup time can be up to 20 seconds, and I'll, again, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then you do the compute, that in this case, it's about 120 seconds worth of compute, and fetch the results. What's happening behind the scenes? And again, I really want to stress that this is not, this is not rocket science, um, although my, my error aster friends are always telling me that what they do is also not rocket science. So it's not clear what that means. But this is, not, this is something an undergrad could put together, and... Um, Indeed, um, the original version of this was all written in a weekend. All we're really doing here, so if, you, if the left side is your laptop, the right side is the cloud, right, is when you execute one of these map uh, invocations, right, from the, the runner or the executor, all we're really doing is we're serializing your function and your data, right, we're sticking it onto S3, right, we're sticking it into Amazon's uh, uh, binary object store. We invoke one of these lambdas. So um, lambda as an interface, um, basically is designed such that you upload a function and then they want you to invoke that many times. So we've built kind of a, a shim handler here, right? So that we always invoke it the same way, but some of the parameters we pass it tell it which of these functions the data execute on. And then remotely what happens is in that Lambda, they pull the job from S3. They download those two objects, right? It downloads a Python Anaconda runtime that we've pre-packaged, right? And actually then begins um, invoking Python out of process to run your code. Right. Meanwhile, you're back here on your laptop, you've, you've invoked the result, right? so it's now going to block waiting for that result, right? and it begins polling S3. Again, like my actual systems friends are like, you're polling the object store? What the hell is wrong with you? But it totally works and it's super reliable, which is great. Um, eventually that function will return, we pickle up the result, right? we serialize the result using Python pickle, we stick it back in S3, um, we get the result, return it to you, and from your perspective, it basically just looked like a map. right? Now, to make this happen, there's a couple of things we depend upon, and, and I don't actually have good slides for it here, but the, the, the unsung hero here of, I think, a lot of this is the underlying serialization technology, right? So um, generally, one of the, the, the big challenges in trying to get your code to run someplace else is handling dependencies and handling um, the fact that there's a tremendous amount of state. So the dynamism of Python makes kind of ahead of time compilation and jitting and all those sorts of things really challenging. But it does mean that there's actually kind of a nice in-memory AST that can be very easy to walk and figure out what those dependencies are. So we actually you depend on a, a package called Cloud Pickle, which is maintained by the PySpark team to pick a closure, to serialize closures, and kind of all of the associated ecosystem and state. And then we also do some module um, dependency analysis, such that if you have pure Python modules on your own machine that don't exist remotely, we'll quite happily upload them and, and, and make those work as well, right? Um, but then we also have this Anaconda runtime, right? So this is, this is the world's tiniest snake, right? It is not a Python. And we would like to have a very small version of a runtime that pre-includes all of these Python packages, right? Um, and this is somewhat hard because, again, remember, we only have 512 megabytes of storage on the actual machine um, that, that these functions are running on. So we have to somehow get an Anaconda Python install, which is roughly 1,200 megabytes, to fit into that space. So we start doing kind of increasingly stupid things. Right, so we first run the conda killing command, which gets rid of a bunch of the, the build system to, or the, the install system detritus. We eliminate all of the package related metadata, which gets us down to 946 megs. We manually delete all the non AVX2 shared objects from MKL, right? So that actually saves us a fair amount. That gets us down to 670. We strip everything out of the shared libraries that we don't really need, including all the debug symbols. Uh, Godspeed. Um, that gets us down to 510, and then if we delete all the intermediate Python uh, cache compilation output, right, we can get down to 441 megabytes, right? So we can kind of barely sneak ourselves in under that 512 um, limit to let us run, again, kind of the full Python or Cydata suite. Um, behind the scenes, right, then we're downloading this runtime, we're untarring it, and that's where that 20 seconds of, set of occasional setup time comes in, and then invoking our function. Now, somewhat fortunately, um, behind the scenes, Amazon with Lambda is caching um, 
a lot of this, right? So in fact, the lambdas are running inside containers and these containers are not purged um, for every function invocation. This originally caused a lot of confusion when you'd run one lambda function and then you'd run another one and you'd look in slash temp and there was crap there and you're like, well, where did, where did that come from? Eventually we realized that it was our own stuff and in fact these, uh, um, and inside an individual container it would be reused for running various lambda functions. So we use that to cache these runtimes um, when we download them. So the first time we do it, it takes that 20 seconds, but all subsequent invocations that take place inside that container are much faster and don't incur this overhead. Um, it's actually kind of neat to start trying to then reverse engineer what Lambda is doing behind the scenes, in particular um, trying to do things like host identification. So of course these are containers running inside like Zen VMs on machines somewhere in like Oregon. Um, and so one thing we found fair, that's fairly reliable is that the um, um, MAC address for the container, of course, stays the same. I guess not of course. It stays the same for the, the life cycle of that container, as far as we can tell, right? And we've done things like, you know, using uh, uh, various measurements of, of pinging hosts and whatnot to try and make sure that's the case. So for the, 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 the next little bit, when I talk about um, individual hosts, Right, or individual containers that are running um, these Lambda jobs, I'm doing the identification based upon MAC address. It's not perfect, there's potentially a lot of um, um, problems with that, but for the time being, I think for, for what I'm trying to show it, it's, it's fairly viable. So what you see then here um, on the right, right, is the, um, is the time between job invocations in seconds, right? And the color of the dot there, right? A, a black dot means that when we invoke that job, the runtime was already present. And a white means that the runtime was not present and we had to re-download it, right? And then the host ID, this from like zero to 150 here, are um, the unique MAC addresses sorted in kind of the order of which we saw them first from one of these results. As we just kind of sequentially invoke 100 jobs. So we invoke 100 jobs, we wait, like 50 seconds, we invoke another 100 jobs, we wait 50 seconds, just to get a handle on what the caching behavior of these things looks like. And unsurprisingly, you know, initially we have some cached up here left over from the previous run, but you can see these white ones here, right? These are all new hosts that we start talking to that we haven't, ta that we haven't seen before. And then for reasons we don't really understand, the next time we do an invocation, some of those hosts are gone. Right? And some new ones get kind of birthed into existence, right? So we start seeing some new things. And of course, over the invocation of doing this 10 times, we end up seeing about 200 unique hosts. And then of course we can titrate what that delay looks like, right? And what you see down here then is on a log scale. Um, but what really I think is useful is looking at the time between job invocation here, and again this is long scale, so 1, 2, 5, 10, 30 minutes, and so on, versus the fraction of new hosts that we've seen. And so what we see is that kind of after 30 minutes or so, all of these instances have been kind of shut down, restarted, and we're getting 100% new hosts. So behind the scenes, Amazon is spinning up these containers, letting them linger for a bit, and then killing them at, at what looks like roughly somewhere between 30 minutes and, and an hour. And you can start then looking, well, what happens? So right now I've been showing where uh, numbers where we have maybe 3,000 of these simultaneous workers. Well, what happens when you ask it to do, say, 10,000 um, jobs worth of activities, right? Um, or in this case, we know that we have roughly 2,000 simultaneous workers, and we're going to invoke um, uh, many more than that jobs. And so what you see here is, if this is the job ID here, um, you can see that these jobs are, are all kind of sequentially started. And then when we do it again, um, because there's variance in when the jobs completes, you start getting this kind of jumble from when the job itself actually starts. But the order is kind of roughly preserved here. That said, there are real ramifications for trying to build distributed systems on top of Lambda. And in fact, um, one of my, my uh, friend, colleague, and former graduate school roommate for five years, uh, Keith Winstein, is a Stanford professor here, and he's the person who um, I had been playing with Lambda, and he's like, well, if you just email Amazon, they'll give you 3,000, and they'll let you run up to 3,000 jobs simultaneously. I was like, it's great. So he's actually working very intensely on trying to build kind of real scale distributed systems on top of Lambda. Um, whereas I'm much more interested in kind of taking advantage of this computing fabric for, again, the sorts of applications where we really just want easy as heck map. Now you can start talking to other Amazon services, including S3. Now S3 is interesting because if you imagine if you try and execute a single transaction where you write something to S3 and then read it back immediately, where you're just writing um, 
a single 16-byte object, right? So you're writing two doubles and reading them back. How many of those transactions can you get per second, right? And the actual number of those transactions across a large number of lambdas here, so we scale up to 200, we don't actually, above that, you know, we can see we're kind of thresholding out here. You can only get roughly, let's say, four to 5,000 simultaneous transactions per second to S3. So when you start thinking about trying to back end other sorts of distributed computing infrastructure out of this, or say use S3 as a synchronization layer, um, that ends up being potentially a challenge. Um, and what you get is these nice errors from S3 where they're like, please reduce your request rate. Which is kind of, you know, it's nice to have Amazon tell you that you're, you're trying too hard. But what we end up having, even before we hit these limits, is an easy to use map. And that means for a lot of kind of data science workloads, we're happy. But often map is not enough, right? A lot of data analytics and a lot of the data analytics that we do ends up you have some data, where evidently the cool figure for data always looks like some nebulous thing from, from a, a CNN ad from 1999. You do some ETL or some pre-processing on it, which is generally embarrassingly parallel. And then you do some featureization, which is again embarrassingly parallel, right? And then you throw it into some machine learning algorithm where that's shown by a, a bunch of boxes connected to other boxes. These sorts of featureization steps, right? All this embarrassingly parallel stuff is actually a great Pyron fit, right? It's everywhere that Hadoop has had some sort of success, right? Um, but on this far side over here, especially at scale, there's this idea that you need some sort of distributed scale, TensorFlow, deep ML based, something, something, right? You need, you know, this is a hard problem. And doing this at scale is a hard problem. And so that means that we're not gonna be giving Jeff Bezos money here, and that, that makes Jeff Bezos sad. But we think we can actually, you know, maybe that's not necessary. And, and you know, uh, Frank McSherry, um, in a widely celebrated paper, had this great quote from uh, Pat Barnum, which is, you can have a second computer when you've shown you know how to use the first one. And Frank McSherry has all these great figures, uh, or these tables in his paper, scalability at what, at what cost, um, that he had at, at Hot OS two years ago, where he showed that actually kind of using the right data structure, um, he could get performance on his laptop right, in a single threaded implementation that exceeded a lot of what you could do with these large scale distributed computing frameworks. Now, to people who are building distributed framework, computing frameworks, we're like, well, yes, obviously that's the case. Um, there's a lot of overhead involved in trying to scale. These aren't necessarily the right scale. But it's important to remember that for most of us, we're not actually at kind of Google scale yet, right? And, and many of us won't be. Many of us just have this problem where they're in this weird interstitial position between what our laptop can do and what we'd like to do in the cloud. And so we built in support for kind of scalable single machine reduce, right? So why not just have a big server, right, with a lot of RAM and try and do all your machine learning on that thing? And you say, but I don't have a big server. But again, that's where Jeff Bezos can help, right? So Amazon now gives you the, the ability to rent by the hour these kind of insanely powerful workstations, right, um, with large numbers of GPUs or large numbers of... Uh, CPUs and insane amounts of RAM, right? The X1.32 the X1 X large has two terabytes of RAM um, and 64 like real cores, and you can rent it for $14 an hour. So for comparison, we bought a machine um, with that number of cores, but half that RAM, one terabyte RAM, it was like 55K, which is a real substantial capital investment. So the idea that, you know, especially if you're trying to do something like fit, do use random features to fit a large SVM or something, on one of these machines, you can get access to this kind of RAM and this kind of compute for only a couple bucks. Means that building an interface like this, where we do our large scale distributed map over um, our data with Lambda, and then we do the reduction all on a single large machine is very possible. And of course, because this is all happening in Amazon's um, uh, bubble, the data transfers are incredibly quick. And so we've been using this sort of framework for um, what up until, what was machine learning up until let's say uh, 2013, right, or 2014. So everything before you start talking about deep learning actually tends to fit pretty well in this framework. Obviously not everything, I really wanna stress that, that um, we're, we're, we're making, I think, no, we're trying to make no contentious claims here, right? The reality is that in fact, most of what the, our colleagues work with fits into this sort of framework and being able to take advantage of a machine like this, again, for 14 bucks an hour, um, for, so for 30 or 40 bucks total, depending on your compute job, is really advantageous, right? But you can also start trying to do crazier things, right? So um, we can spin up via Amazon's Elastic Cache um, Redis instances and start trying to do things like use Redis as a parameter server, right? Um, and you can imagine then having your lambdas kind of swap information and do coordinated optimization through those. So we're using uh, play, recently playing around with using Pyron coupled with Redis 
um, for large scale kind of derivative free optimization for various problems that end up looking like reinforcement learning and it works kind of, again, shockingly well. And the nice thing is you can just take your existing legacy C library or your existing Python and ship it out there, right? And you might say, well, but for these sorts of systems, I don't, I can't use Amazon's infrastructure, right? This doesn't really help me. I already have, you know, a cluster. But fortunately, you know, companies like Kubernetes are doing an impressive job of taking this kind of container orchestration technology and providing function-like interfaces on top of it, right? Um, so there's this hope that kind of maybe this idea of not mallocking servers to run your jobs, that actually mallocking kind of tiny little bits of computation via functions might be a path forward even, even locally. And so for us, and one of the things Dennis asked me to talk about is what, we're, what my actual day job is, um, we're using it for a lot of uh, uh, what we think of as, as interesting applications, even if the underlying kind of um, computation graphs are not terribly interesting, right? Um, we do a lot of computational imaging. So, so my group in, uh, uh, with Ben works closely with Laura Waller's group to build imaging systems that exploit computation um, to let you kind of get away with, with, with novel or crazy ideas on the hardware. So you can imagine, for example, trying to build a camera where you instead throw away all of the existing optics infrastructure, right? No lenses, but basically take a piece of diffuser, um, so shower privacy glass, right? The stuff that's in your shower window, hopefully, um, and just basically randomizes the incoming direction of light. And so if you imagine if you, if you take that, you place it, you know, let's say 200, 300 microns in front of your CCD, you take an image, you get something that kind of looks like this, right? Which looks like junk. But of course, most of the information is still there. You can do a lot of pre-processing and actually recover the image. And what you've really built here algorithmically is a camera system that exploits the underlying physical properties of the diffuser coupled with a lot of kind of compute, including exploiting these complex forward models and running large scale solvers um, to solve this. And, and, and everyone, you know, most of the people who are working on this, it's, it's not actually us, right? It's very smart kind of applied physicists who again are, are kind of potentially trapped in this MATLAB hell. And we were able to convince them, well, try rewriting your forward models in Python um, or porting some of your, your existing legacy code and see what you can get. And now they're capable of kind of doing, scale, uh, uh, doing these sorts of problems for, right now they were previously they were just at the single stage camera phase uh, or single stage image phase and now they're doing video. So they're, they're the people we're trying to empower here. Similarly, you know, I work um, with, with some colleagues here at Stanford on various interesting problems in solar physics, including kind of trying to understand um, what gives rise to various explosions on the surface of the sun. So what you're looking at right now is a picture of the sun in various wavelengths captured by the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory, which generates about one and a half terabytes a day of solar imaging data. And that interesting region there um, that seems to be doing stuff is called an active region. And sometimes for reasons that we don't actually quite understand, these very energetic active regions explode and send large streaming, uh, uh, either large bursts of x-rays or, or large streaming chunks of, of plasma towards the Earth. And we'd like to be able to understand when that happens and, and, and potentially even predict it. And so what we've been doing is, is using, again, the, the solar data um, from SDO through Lambda to try and do this sort of analysis. But there's a tremendous amount of pre-processing that has to happen to each of those images um, before we just start trying to run some sort of classification or regression algorithm on them. And so we've ported all of that. We've been using all of that with Lambda. Similarly, we do a lot of computational neuroscience, right? So in neuroscience, we're increasingly generating these insane data volumes, right? What you see on the left there is the connectome of a mouse retina. So it's literally the, the schematic diagram of the connection between a thousand different neurons um, in the visual, in the early stage visual system, so in the retina, which actually does a tremendous amount of analog computation of a mouse. And the connectivity matrix there is, is the, the square labeled A. And we've been building kind of probabilistic algorithms with kind of strong uh, non-parametric priors to extract out what those, what those circuit diagrams look like and what the underlying cell type and cell morphology is. Right? And all of that is basically large scale Markov chain Monte Carlo, which as anyone who's done MCMC knows, you'd like to run a very large number of simultaneous chains to get a good estimate of your posterior. So we've been using Lambda there for kind of scaling up these sorts of MCMC type tasks. And we're even talking with people who are interested in probabilistic programming approaches about backing, using uh, um, PyRend as a backend for their computations. Because again, they have large numbers of independent operations that they wish to run simultaneously. Um, we've even been, you know, playing around with what the limits might actually be of neuroscience, right? So we wrote this paper um, um, somewhat for fun um, where we took a, a classic system, the MOS 6502, 
right? We reverse engineered it, or some people we, uh, uh, we know of did. Um, it, we have a simulator that's capable of playing Donkey Kong, and then we took all of that resulting data from that brain and applied neuroscience data analytic methods um, to try and understand what was actually going on. And um, for, surprising to some, unsurprising to others, actually, from purely observational data of high dimensional time series, it's difficult to say definitively um, without strong models about what's going on in the computation. And this suggests that maybe, you know, there may be some challenges for neuroscience in this big data uh, uh, universe lying ahead. But for all of this, we were able to use PyREN to both run the forward simulations, do all the per image analysis, and kind of push everything forward, right? And if you're at all interested in kind of what is the neuroscience of a microprocessor look like, I'm also speaking on this tomorrow in uh, uh, phil uh, philosophy and uh, symbolic systems class. Um, because, you know, who doesn't want to come down to Stanford twice in one week? Um, so we're trying to get to the point where we have large numbers of people kind of using this system and teasing out where the challenges are, right? So we've been running, Shifan's been running some experiments where we see that, you know, Lambda will scale up to a point, but then we're starting to hit what some of those limits are. And so we're very curious kind of how can we get around some of those limits, including doing things like aggressively spinning up discrete Amazon instances behind the scenes that the users aren't responsible for. Right now we do a lot of munging of the control and data plane because um, it was written by some dude in a weekend. And so we're trying to segregate that out to potentially kind of allow for more finer grained control over when jobs fail or break or when things are getting retried. And then the real, the real star of this in some sense is the serialization technology that of course we had very little to do with. Um, and a lot of that credit goes first to the PySpark team and then before that to a startup called Multivac which was trying to offer a similar service. Um, and there, I mean, there are just a lot of weird, weird edge cases in Python, right? The Python subprocess module that you, you know, you call to invoke some out of process thing, um, when it throws an exception, that exception is actually not pickleable for no good reason other than there's a bug and that bug has persisted for like years because why would you be trying to pickle the pro? Why would you be trying to serialize the processes, uh, the exceptions thrown by this random subprocess thing? So there are lots of these sorts of things that we're having a special case and kind of make that technology more and more complicated. But we're hoping to kind of isolate that out into a separate project so other people, including uh, um, a new distributed systems project at, at Berkeley called Ray, as well as a, a, a um, uh, machine learning project called Clipper can use. Um, but other than that, um, the, um, again, this is, this is only due to my colleagues that we've gotten this far. Um, but the code is available, and you can pip install it. If you have an AWS account, you can play with it and break it. Um, and uh, let me know if you run into any bugs. Um, other than that, uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, with the MCMC case you were talking about earlier, um, how like there's a burn-in period, right? And that can't, and that can't be parallelized, right? Like each individual subtask has to do that. I guess how do you know when you've reached the end of that? Great. So, in fact, the the um, the the burn is burn in is a, is in many ways the thing we're most trying to like paralyze, right, or, or run large numbers of chains to get around, right. For the the, the question of when you hit the uh, when your MCMC chain is burned in is an open one that no one has a good answer to, right. Um, for us, what we actually do in practice is we start you know ten thousand chains from different random initializations. Um, we run them for a long for a long enough time such that for compared to what we've seen um, on synthetic data, they've mixed well enough that we get the right answer, right. But there's there's no I mean this is I used to be a real MCMC diehard. Um, and now working in a, a convex analysis lab, um, I may have, have, have backed off a little bit from my, my, my belief in the probabilistic religion. Um, but it's hard. It's hard. Um, but it, the nice thing is, again, for, for um, our belief, especially for these kind of structured non-parametric um, models, um, the thought is that, um, one, anytime you're, uh, there's lots of symmetries present in that resulting posterior because, like, you know, there are lots of equivalent clusterings that have different assignments, right? So these kind of these label switching problem type things. And so starting from a bunch of different ram random initializations is the only thing we've really found that gives us enough of an accurate kind of estimate of the posterior where we kind of believe the uncertainty coming out of it on the other side. Um, but in each of those cases, you know, we eat the burn in for the first, you know, five or ten or fifteen or twenty minutes, um, and then um, then take a couple of samples and then call it good. 
Um, other things people have looked at in the MCMC space include techniques like parallel tempering that, that help you get around this. And you know, those sorts of things are also kind of super amenable to these sorts of lambda jobs where, where you run a number of chains and then you kind of do this, you know, it's a standard BSP type workload, right? Run a bunch of chains, synchronize, run a bunch of chains, synchronize, and lambda is a nice fit there. Did that answer your question? Uh, and oh, <laughs> my apologies, great. Um, other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so you you download all of the dependencies into like slash temp on the lambdas, and then you you must do some sort of check to see that they're still there and are still like in a like coherent state before you re reuse those inside of the. Lambdas. So s still there, yes. Coherent state, no. You could go and muck up the, muck about with them if you wanted. Okay. Um, but yeah, we the the S three objects all have are all like hashed for you, right? They all have some um, EID which reflects the. Um, which is just this, this hash of the contents. So we identify our runtimes based upon those, and then um, we download them if, if the URL that we're using as the runtime has that particular EID has changed. So when, you, uh, when you're like checking you know, files which exist in like slash temp, do you do, you, do, you do a check, or do you just run the code and things like break? Like, I'm not sure. Does Amazon provide any sort of guarantees on like, you know, things, if things in slash temp that you are reusing that they're still like so, so right. So, as far as we've been able to tell, so Amazon provides no. I mean, these are you're, we're we're getting increasingly in the, the the area of things that Amazon doesn't really make claims about in public, right? right? So, from what we've seen, either temp is there and exists in the state that you left it, or you're on a completely new machine, right? And so, what we do by caching, we don't we we do no no. Um, no integrity checks at all, right? So if if Amazon had some daemon that went through and randomly deleted a bunch of crap, then 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 we'd just be would be a little bit screwed, right? But we haven't seen that in practice. We find that that um, the if if a lambda has some detritus in it, then it is both our detritus and has not been mucked in any sort of substantial way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I'm just it'd be interesting if there's like security concerns. You know, so. There are massive security. Well, so the, 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 you don't ever share a Lambda with a different account. And in fact, you don't ever share a Lambda with a different, um, um, the, as far as we can tell, the tuple of your um, Amazon username and the Lambda function um, are always given unique containers. So if I upload two different handlers, those two handlers will never see each other's uh, temp at all. Um, and we've, we've gotten some kind of verbal confirmation from randomly running into AWS people that, that that's the design. But of course, you know, the containers are not, I mean, part of the, the, the concern here is in fact that the containers actually aren't terribly secure, right? And in fact, when you, when you run these things and you start poking around, you're like, oh, I can see other processes here. And I can see like, you know, there's other weird information leaking out from adjacent jobs. Um, but um, as, far as, we, as far as we know, um, all of the containers even on one virtualized host are only unique to that username, uh, lambda function tuple, right? Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there exist enterprising security people who are, 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 are working hard to confirm or, or deny those statements, but that's what we've seen. Um, otherwise, I mean, that actually is one of the challenges in trying to scale something like this up, even um, internally inside an organization, right? Is that, you know, I'm not sure how much I would want other people's code that I didn't necessarily trust running in an adjacent container on one of these things or kind of one after another. Yes, sir. Uh, how much entropy do you get per, random, or per lambda container? Like, have you had problems exhausting the system entropy in one of these things? Oh, um, I never, I don't think I've ever actually asked for system entropy. It's a good question. Um, um, the, everything I do is with a, you know, MT1997, uh, uh, pseudo random source. Um, I do nothing interesting cryptographically or anything like that. So I don't actually know. That's a that's a that'd be a neat thing to check. I actually have no idea how how even you know hardware entropy works with containers at all. Right? Maybe it just returns zero 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 all the time. I, I assume not, but it might. Um, any other questions? Awesome. Great. Thank you.
Right. My name is Eric Jonas. I'm currently a postdoc at UC Berkeley in EECS, working primarily with Ben Recht, um, partly as part of the new Berkeley Center for Computational Imaging, and partly as part of this new thing called the RISE Lab, which is the uh, evolutionary, um, if not spiritual, successor to what was previously known as the AMP Lab. Um, and today I'm going to be mostly talking about um, a little bit about my, my actual day job. Um, uh, but mostly about this, this platform that, that we've started taking advantage of offered by Amazon Web Services called Lambda and a, a software layer we wrote called Pyren um, that's primarily designed to make a lot of the data science type calculations that uh, we do easy. Um, and what do I mean when I talk about those types of calculations? And I want to say, you know, um, it really, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older than I think the average postdoc, um, and it does really, in many ways, feel like the wheel has, has come around again and, and even again. Um, and in particular, and that's true, but there are a lot of potential advantages, including reproducibility and, and uh, scale and the inability or the, the, the fact that you don't personally have to be the person making large capital outlays that make a lot of these novel cloud computing environments attractive. But what, while we were giving this talk and Chevron was walking through kind of, you know, what the different storage mechanisms are and the difference between S3 and DynamoDB and all of these sorts of things, um, one of the PIs, uh, Ren Ng, um, who's now a professor at Berkeley, said, well, why is there no cloud button? And <clears throat> at the time, um, we all thought he was nuts and we're like, that's such a Ren thing to say. Like, of course, you want to think about like the simple product that we could try and sell. It's very uh, uh, product focused uh, uh, PI. Um, and what would a cloud button even be? But when we started talking about it um, and talking to more and more of our, our colleagues, we came to this realization that in fact, there is no cloud button, but maybe there could be. And, and in fact, it really does seem that the cloud is too damn hard. Um, for a large class of users. So, so James McMillan, the, the founder of the, the Rent is Too Damn High party, may have really hit on something here, right? Um, and when we did a survey in the, AMP, in the then AMP lab, now RISE lab, of graduate students. So these are graduate students for, with PIs like Jan Stoika, Mike, to transition over to something that looks more modern or is, is kind of uh, uh, more amenable to, say, contemporary machine learning techniques like Python. Um, and so that, this was kind of the other hook here was can we build a platform that offers kind of sufficient advantage that we can, we can use this as a hook here. But of course, I hate computers. Um, you're trying to upset creep maples is what you're trying exactly, to do. Exactly, exactly. Um, no, and, 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 and there's this real problem though and that like, you know, the reality is that, that, that we all reluctantly use these, these um, approximations to Turing machines on our desk um, because they can do lots of powerful things, but also, you know, as someone who um, actually spilled coffee on my laptop keyboard two nights ago and, and the shift key has not recovered since, um, the physical instantiation of the hardware is an incredible uh, uh, pain point. And then also simply configuring and working with them can be quite a challenge. And, and this, isn't, this isn't just something that those of us who aren't real systems people run into. I mean, um, we have this weekly computational imaging lunch um, and one of our graduate students, one of my collaborators, Shivaram, um, was trying to explain to everyone <coughs> when they should be using cloud infrastructure because, you know, on one hand, as, as my PI Ben likes to say, cloud is just another word for someone else's computer. Um, and there are a lot of things that used to be very easy, or at least I remember them as being very easy. Now I may have been 22 at the time, so who really knows? Um, it seems like they've gotten very hard. And so we're going to talk about how we can kind of perhaps uh, um, reverse that trend a little bit for, for the both the users and the classes of applications I care about. And, and what are some of those examples? Well, a lot of what we do, oh, and going back, um, this is, of course, all joint work with, with my colleagues, uh, Shivaram, Shifan, and then our advisors, Ben and Jan. Um, um, the, I am not a systems person. Um, by I, I'm much more in the, the applied math bucket. Um, so this has been a fun adventure, I think, for, for everyone involved. Um, but um, a lot of what we work on are problems that are of a computational imaging nature. So problems like adaptive optics, where you'd like to kind of in real time adjust parameters of your imaging system to it, see things better. Or super resolution microscopy, where you want to use kind of strong priors about your image to see things you couldn't see before. Or t problems of tomography, where um, you'd like to see inside some structure just from boundary value measurements. Or problems like phase contrast microscopy, where the actual image that you're trying to receive, or recover is not visible in your target wavelength, but if you can exploit properties of, of phase delay, then maybe you can see the, the target. And in all of these application areas, um, 
we have this amazing property where we often have very good forward models, right? Physics, especially at this scale, is kind of by and large worked out. And so what we end up with are very good forward models that we'd like to run many, many, many times. Um, and um, often these are forward models that are, are being run using existing legacy pieces of software um, and perhaps rewriting them all is, is not a good idea for, um, certainly not for a postdoc, maybe not for a graduate student. And so part of our challenge was how do we convince some of these colleagues though that we're collaborating with in these computational imaging spaces to give up their loved tools, right? So a lot of these busy physicists and double E's are all real MATLAB aficionados, right? And as, as someone with kind of formal computer science training, the idea of writing MATLAB um, as part of my day job makes me want to vomit a little bit. Um, similarly, how can you convince, uh, how can I convince like some of my solar physics co colleagues to um, give up tools like IDL, right, which is, is kind of like MATLAB, but worse in every way. Um, and it's hard because there's a tremendous amount of legacy software that's been written in, um, in both of these pipelines. And, and, and so the question becomes kind of how do you convince people? What is the hook you can use to get them 